All righty, folks. How's it going? Thank you all so much for chiming in for the latest show here in Wardy NYM. Guys, we have so much to break down and a special segment of a series preview show as I'll be first breaking down everything that you guys need to know about the latest Mets series coming up starting tomorrow night. Finally, the Mets will be wrapping up their West Coast trip. It's been a long overdue. I'm over at Array, being on the East Coast, covering these games post games after the game already happened. I'm just absolutely dragged and exhausted from it. But they play the Halo starting tomorrow night. We have some big things, including Tyler McGill's return. We have a lot to talk about in regards to the Mets' health status with many players in the roster right now, along with a huge Max Scherzer update that many of you guys know by now. That was first broken from my good buddy that's been on the channel plenty, Pat Ragazzo, who does a great job on the beat for the Mets for Sports Illustrated. But guys, a lot to break into. Again, we'll be deep diving a complete series preview. Then from there, I'll be deep diving forward. What has been going right and wrong for the Mets here in June? Should we panic at all? Should we be perfectly fine with how things have transpired? Especially in that abysmal series loss in which I broke down those post-game shows for the past couple nights. Make sure to check it out against the Padres if you haven't already, folks. But in a nutshell, we have a lot to get into. This will be a launch show today. For people on replay, it'll probably be around, I would say, around tops 40 minutes. Maybe less, maybe more. But for people in the live stream, we're going to be live for at minimum two hours today. We're going to get live callers in. We're going to get many of you guys to share your questions, comments, and concerns. And just talk all things Mets today. Again, a special segment, knowing that's an off day. So why not take full advantage and get a lot more things, points out there than maybe what I originally do when the Mets, of course, play consecutive games. And I know that a series preview show only holds so much because, again, they're going to be playing a game in a couple hours. But thankfully, again, today we have at more than 24 hours until the game starts. So let's deep dive it. But first, before I do anything else, I want to thank everyone so much for first chiming in. I really do appreciate that. I see Jocelyn, Dave, great friend on the channel, Killer, Ethan, John, Chicken, uh, D-Book, how's it going? My great friend and member on the show, Darren, how are you, my friend? Thank you so much for chiming in. Uh, no name, all you guys. Appreciate you kindly. Continue smashing that like and subscribe button as you guys are first chiming in to the live show, live or on replay. And like I said, I cannot not emphasize this enough. We have a lot to get into. This will be a prolonged segment more than usual for a series preview, but no less, I'm excited to break it down. So I really don't think there's any more that I got to say in regards to the introduction here. Let's just deep dive, folks. And I think the first thing that we need to discuss, which I say we'll spend, you know, at minimum five minutes or so talking about, along with, of course, answering your questions when we have live cars. I'm sure some of you guys will may ask about it, too. But the biggest update that we have gotten for the Mets today is no, not regarding Pete Alonso or Stony Marte on their health status. I'm sure by the time the Mets start tomorrow night's game, we will have a better gauge by then after the live show, of course, on what is going to be the stats for them in the series. But Mad Max Scherzer has broken down from Pat Ragazzo on the beat for the Mets, as I explained a second ago. Came out with an article a couple hours ago that, yes, according to sources, Max Scherzer has, in fact, already started his bullpen throwing. He's been doing some light tosses, nothing crazy yet, but he's already ahead of schedule, and that is impressive enough because I was, by all means, did not have a certain timeline for Scherzer. He, of course, went down with his oblique injury back around May 19th is when he got put on the IL. So it's only been a couple weeks. It has been a long now, and the timeline for him viewed like at minimum two months, along with getting ramped up. So two months of basically not doing much, and then and potentially getting ramped up and actually getting yourself back with the team after a couple rehab starts. But no, Max is already starting to throw bullpens. And there is speculation even that we could see Max facing live batters and gain a sim game in potentially as soon, a rehab start, if you will, as soon as the end of next week. Nothing's a guarantee at this point in time, but the 37-year-old Bulldog, who we know is so crucial to Mets in this rotation and going anywhere this year, I don't want the Mets to rush him by any stretch, but it's clear that obviously Scherzer's ahead of schedule, not because he's being rushed, but rather that he, again, is feeling healthy, feeling right, and that's huge for a Mets team that, again, has had their fair share of injuries, not just offensively as of late, but in this rotation, they have yet to see Jacob DeGrom this year. Jake is progressing well, and nothing is certain on when we will get both Jake and Max back. But speculation as of now is that we very well could see, should there be no setbacks whatsoever, that Scherzer will return to the New York Mets in their rotation as soon as early July, folks. So we're looking at right around a month away at this point in time, if not sooner. That is absolutely fantastic. That made my day. I'm sure it made your guys' day, too. And again, we all know the story with injuries. You don't want to go too far and get ahead of yourself. I always say that everyone be cautiously optimistic. You know, don't view this as a sure guarantee thing. Let's just ride it out. Hope that again, he continues to ramp up these bullpens. And even hopefully by the end of next week, gets himself in with a rehab starter rate. I mean, that would just be absolutely nuts if he's facing live batters this soon, a week or so from now. I mean, that would be mind-boggling to me. But again... He's a bulldog, and Scherzer, I cannot wait to see him back in this rotation. And just the thought of both Max and Jake returning around the same time 
whether that is going to be sometime in early to mid-July, which feels realistic as of now, that is absolutely monstrous for this team that, again, has rided out a commanding lead seven games above 500 still on the Braves for first in the NL East. They're 38 right now and 21 on the season. And this has been without one start from Jacob DeGrom, the best pitcher in baseball. And this has been without Max Scherzer for multiple weeks now. So massive update. I'm so pumped up to talk more about it with you guys when we get to the Q&A and live caller segment later on in this prolonged stream. But again, want to give you guys a quick update in case you weren't aware. And shout out once more to everyone that's first chiming in. My, what, 100 plus viewers? Thank you guys all so much. Greatly appreciate it. But yes, that was the Mad Max update, folks. So now let's deep dive and take a look at what is next for the Mets here in this series. I'll be breaking down this series preview entirely. Then from there, I'll be really breaking down what has been going right and what has been going wrong for the Mets since the start of June, especially with how they faltered in that Padres series. What are really the reasons for it and what can we look ahead, not just beyond the Halos series, but once the Mets get back in town next week, back at City Field, which is going to be awesome. But breaking down this Halo series, guys, you probably all know by now, the Los Angeles Angels have lost 14 straight games. They are due. I'm not going to sit here and say, oh, they're going to be an easy win. Anything is anything can happen in baseball. We know that story by now. The Pittsburgh Pirates just swept the Dodgers a couple series ago. The Mets just got pistol whipped by the Padres. I mean, it's early in the year. Anything can happen. And even with the Halos team losing 14 straight, and even after firing Joe Madden a couple of games ago, they are due 1,000%. 1, and it would be the farthest thing from surprising if they at minimum win one of three games in this three-game set against the Mets. But after starting off so strong, this year for the Angels after a strong offseason. They picked up a bunch of former Mets and Noah Syndergaard, Aaron Loop. that will be deep diving shortly on what we will potentially see from them in this series. You know, finally having these two teams match up and to have us face the likes of Thor and Aaron Loop among others. But the Angels, after a really hot start this year, after a strong offseason, they are now 27-31 and 31 on the year, again, dropping 14 straight games. And half of those games, seven to be exact, have been losses by one run. So talking about demoralizing losses, the Angels have been finding new and creative ways to lose time and time again. They are now in their series finale tonight in a four-game set against the Red Sox. They're trying to break that. I kind of hope for their sake that they do. Shohei Otani is on the mound tonight, and I would prefer that because I'd rather them get at least one win prior to the Mets series because it feels inevitable that if they don't that they're going to at least win one if not multiple against our Amazons regardless on how the Mets are going to perform but again the Angels off to not a good stretch over this past month plus and hopefully for their sake it changes all I say as a Mets fan biasly is that that doesn't change drastically until after the Mets face them starting tomorrow night folks but when we look at pitching matchups, there is plenty to be appealed by and plenty to be interested in for both the Mets and the Angels here. And I have the little, you know, the star next to Lorenzen, Sandoval, and Thor because they are not official yet. The Angels at this point in time, at the time being live here, have not made it official what their rotation is going to be. But if you look at every other site and you look at now every five days, you know, normally for a rotation, it looks like it's going to be Michael Lorenzen. The veteran right-hander, first or second year now with the Angels, is going to be getting the start in game one against Tyler McGill, my man. You guys know I love Tyler McGill. We love Julie's mom is a great member and friend on the channel. We love the McGill family. Tyler has last pitched for the Mets back on May 11th where he gave up eight earn and only one inning against the Nationals. He clearly looked like he was tipping his pitches. And then coincidentally enough, I mean, it was separate. He wasn't hurt during that game. But then after that, that's where they randomly found out about his inflammation a day or two later. And then he got put on the IL. But McGill is ready to go. He's going to be pitching around 70 to 75 pitches more than likely in the game one start. And it is an Apple TV broadcast. I do apologize. I did not have to experience that as a fan when the Mets Face the Nationals in game two of this year uh, back in D.C. I was in attendance for that game when Scherzer made his debut for the Mets this year. And that was the Apple TV broadcast. I know that it was horrendous from what everyone said. You know, I have no clue I'm going to watch it. Maybe I'll have to sink, you know, Howie doing the radio call with it. Whatever needs to be done. But just warning you guys now, yes, it's Apple TV. Love the visuals, but the coverage was absolutely horrendous from everything that I saw. So we'll see if this one is anything different or not. Either way, massive matchup for McGill. Again, on the season, he's 4-2 and two with a 4.41 ERA. But again... Keep in mind that he was clearly tipping his pitches. I don't really think there was any doubt about that. And that national started with such an anomaly of the game. And a game prior to that for McGill, he was cruising. He had five scoreless, continuing his no-hit streak in two straight starts. And then he had a couple guys on base. Adam Adovino came in the game, and Adovino couldn't even get one out for him. And he was charged with all those earned runs. Three or four ended up being the case there in that one a couple starts ago for him. So... Point is, though, McGill, he has the nasty stuff. I'm so pumped to see him back in this rotation. The Mets definitely need it because even though that the likes of guys like Peterson and Williams haven't been the issue for the rotation, 
Chris Bassett has. So regardless, there has been at least one guy consistently faltering in this rotation over his past five starts. And that's why it's vital for the Mets to get this depth and Tyler will surely bring it. And again, for Michael Lorenzen, he's having a very strong start to the year for the Angels. He has a three, a five and three, one loss record with 3.69 year Ray for the towering right-hander. That's going to be a fun matchup. Very excited for tomorrow night, as I'm sure you guys are too. Regardless on um, when you're watching this, hopefully you're watching this by time uh, that the game didn't happen already. Because if you did, then, you know, this is only going to hold so much. But getting in game two, folks, what are we looking out here in game two? We have, in my opinion, the biggest game of this series. And yes, you might be wondering, Tyler, how are you saying that game two is potentially more important than game three with Noah Syndergaard? Yes, the longtime New York Mac and Mr. Noah Syndergaard Thor, as people would love to call him, on the bump for the potential rubber match should they win and lose a game. Here's the thing. The Mets have Cookie Carrasco on the bump, who's tied with the lead league as of now in the NL with wins, 7-1 win-loss record, a 3.52 ERA. Just came off of a phenomenal outing where I believe he had seven innings, only giving up two earned runs. Cookie has been an absolute gem for the Mets more often than not this year, and that's been huge for this rotation as well. But the reason why I think this game is so important is as simple as the fact that Pop... I was going to say Pablo, Patrick Sandoval, who on the season three and one with his 2.81 year Ray got worked in his last start, gave up five earned, but regardless, Sandoval is a southpaw. What has been one of the biggest Mets kryptonites, not just this season, but in years past, it's facing left-hand starting pitching. So I don't love the intrigue there whatsoever for Sandoval, who again is a criminally underrated starting pitcher, had some really nice, uh, outings for the Angels last year and is now taking his game to a little bit of another level this year in LA. I mean, that is, in my opinion, the biggest game from a starting pitching standpoint. The Mets get shelled against that lefty. That can make or break them 1,000% winning this series. Doesn't matter the offense or lack thereof that we're going to see from the Angels or the bullpen implosion that has been inevitable plenty of times for the Angels this year. Regardless, this pitching matchup is, in my opinion, unbelievably huge, and I'm keeping my eye on this game specifically uh, Saturday night around 9.38 or 9.40 p.m. Eastern time. That lefty, that's huge. The Mets need to jump on him. And if they can't, continues the narrative that they struggle against Southpaws. And again, that could be their demise and trying to get above 500 or at least around 500 or so by wrapping up this West Coast trip as they are currently three and four through their first seven games here out West. But now gaining game three, folks, and this is the big one. Last but not least, finally the first game in literally 10, what, a nine, at least nine games it feels like or so, something along those lines. Will the Mets have a good time? It's a 7 p.m. Eastern start there in L.A., and it's going to have Noah Syndergaard, first matchup against the New York Mets as an L.A. Angel. We know the story by now, the little drama that happened throughout social media throughout the year. It's going to make for a fun outing. Noah on the year has had a pretty strong season bouncing back from his injuries, 4-4 four and four with 3.69 year Ray. But I got to say, guys, outside of Sandoval, I am very much so concerned for Noah Syndergaard because this is going to go one of two ways, in my opinion. I think Noah is either going to completely dominate the Mets and lead the Angels to victory, or at least give them a quality start to help them the best he can. Or two, the Mets are going to completely shell him, and that could, could, could go directly in hand if the Mets have both, say, Alonzo and Marte, or at least one of the two back in the lab by Game 3 of this series. But the biggest thing that thing that stands out to me folks is not just Noah matching up once more against these Mets you know for the first time in his career but the fact that Noah has been Jekyll and Hyde so far this year through nine starts whether he's home or away even against the same teams he has struggled mightily if he's home or away so for example Noah Syndergaard on the road this year has a 7.88 year right he got shelled and gave up six runs Four earned or so, a massive amount of runs they gave up against the Texas Rangers a couple starts to go. His next start would be in LA against those same Rangers, and he shut them down. Home this year for Noah, he has a 1.48 year ray. So Noah loves LA. He's thriving there in that ballpark, but he got shelled in the Bronx recently against the Yankees last week or so, and he's been getting shelled more often than not when he's facing batters away. And that, unfortunately for the Mets, is not the case where we get to see him at City Field right now. We're in LA, and that is, if we're basing things on early numbers, that's something to keep in mind that Noah has quite literally been a Jekyll and Hyde pitcher based on off of where he, exactly he is pitching for the most part this season. When he is bat when he is pitching at home, the batters for the opposing team have on average a 500 or so OPS. When he is a pitcher away, they, he just hasn't given up 11 more runs than at home, but the opponent batting average, not batting average, OPS is over 900. So again, drastic splits, and that's going to make it very interesting to see how they are going to match up there for the series finale, which again, has all the makings to potentially be a rubber match like we saw with Shamanaya and Chris Bassett last night. And unfortunately, that went to Shamanaya and it really wasn't close, but 
Now getting into, we broke down the pitching matchups, guys. You know that story by now. Let's get in the key Mets this series. And if you guys have watched previous series videos, and you know that series preview videos, and you know that I really emphasize matchups, especially for these batters against the opposing pitchers throughout their career. I emphasize that. I emphasize what they've done so far against the team throughout the season. If they played them numerous times, I emphasize day and night games. I do all these things, but given the uncertainties with the Mets at, as things stand with their lineup on who's going to be healthy, who's going to be in there, how are they going to be feeling? And with the Angels as well, 14 game losing streak entering tonight's game. I honestly hope for their sake that they win it again, because I think that may benefit the Mets after all. But the point is, again, for the Mets to come in here we have multiple guys slumping, and I think that is what we should be keeping more of an eye on, especially if one or both of Marte and Alonzo are out for, at minimum, one or even two, if not the entirety of this series. So you got to keep an eye on them. Alonzo Marte, that is going to drastically impact the Mets having strong, consistent offense. It, Alonzo, he's an MVP caliber player this year. When you don't have him in the lineup, it's such a gaping hole. And Marte, he doesn't just bring so much for you at the plate, but it's his ability on the base pass. The best base runner that the Mets have outside of guys like Jankowski, when healthy, and some others. And then in the outfield, has a phenomenal glove. He just brings an element to the Mets that was so desperately needed from years past, but now he's finally here. So really, it all will be indicative on how much playing time, if at all, these guys will get their both day to day. Alonzo's having swelling, trying to get the rehab done quickly on his hand, returning the lot. Marte said he feels really good with his groin tightness and that he doesn't believe he'll need an IL stint. So it's a day by day feeling out type situation. The Mets having a day off today at the time being alive here is massive and should help them with the likelihood of them potentially being in the live for at least one or two games at minimum in the series but again we'll see but there are some guys slumping and one thing that coincides with these injuries is the fact that the guys that are slumping the most so far for the Mets here out west are the exact same guys that have been dealing with nagging injuries. It starts with Brandon Nimmo. Nimmo has had by far the worst start to a month this entire season. He's batting just over 100 with a sub 400 OPS in June through uh, eight games. And if you're wondering, why is Nimmo struggling so much? Why is he striking out more? It all goes directly in hand with his wrist injury. Let's not forget Nimmo, I believe, in the series against the Phillies, received a, uh, I think it was a national series before that, actually, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, he received a cortisone shot injection right around that time. That was multiple series ago, a couple weeks ago for the Mets, but he's still not 100%. His swing has never been the same. He's had some solid games, but you can definitely tell that when Nemo is dealing with his injury and the Mets need him to continue playing, even with him not being 100% because they just don't have the depth right now that he can ride through it. But you can tell that he's laboring a little bit and it's affecting his approach at the plate. Yes, we've been seeing some strong pitching from the likes of the Dodgers and the Padres. I will not, not denounce that whatsoever, but it doesn't change the fact that Nimmo is not 100%. And you can clearly tell that in his swing as approach right now at the plate because Brandon Nimmo on average is getting on base a couple times a night. And when he's striking out a couple times a night in consecutive games, you know that's a red flag and you know something is wrong. So the Mets desperately need Nimmo to play a really strong series here, at least hope for, because Nimmo at the end of the day, if you don't have that play setter, Man, oh man, does that have an impact on the remainder of the lineup? Far more than you would think. And we've seen that thus far in this West Coast trip. But outside of Nemo, the same man who, again, is dealing with injuries too, but a more recent injury, and Francisco Lindor. No one should be surprised that Francisco Lindor is not performing too well right now when he has a 179 average, a 521 OPS so far in the month of June over these eight games when Lindor wasn't even able to play the first game or so against the Dodgers because he jammed his freaking finger, had a small fracture in the hotel door. And he still has that little cast, I believe, on his middle finger there, his throwing hand no less. So it's affected his defense a little bit. It's affected a bit of his approach at the plate. And yes, I know he still had some nice hits and some nice games for the Mets. But the point is, is that it, it makes perfect sense why Lindor is not off to a hot start here in June after rolling for a large portion of May there. And it goes directly in hand with his injury. I mean, I can only imagine how tedious that is and annoying for him. But again, he can play through it, so he is. But just because a guy can play through it doesn't mean that he's going to play nearly to the caliber that he was in his previous series when he was red hot. So especially if, say, one or both of Marte and Alonzo are out for a majority of this three-game set, you need someone like Francisco Lindor to step up. He's proven the past. He will again, absolutely. And give him the benefit of the doubt with injuries 100%. But still, at the end of the day, if you're in this Mets lineup, you're in the lineup for a reason. You're healthy enough to perform. So let's see you perform, especially when the Mets, again, if you don't have Alonzo and or Marte, those are gaping holes, and you need to replace them. And the Mets, a team that has looked abysmal out West when they lose games, scoring little to no runs, that has to change, especially against this Angels team that is, by all means, the most beatable team right now on paper in baseball. Take advantage of the opportunities given to you. Let's see these guys heal up more, and hopefully this off day will truly help them quite a bit. And again, guys, I see a bunch of you all chiming in the show. Thank you all so much for that. 
continue smashing that like and subscribe button if you're enjoying this series preview. After I break down the series preview, guys, I'll be breaking down more on what went right and what went wrong so far for the Mets in the month of June. Should we be freaking out about that abysmal series against the Padres? What was the context behind, of course? And what is the outlook for the Mets going forward as they head home next week and beyond? Along with them from there, answering all your questions, comments, and concerns, and taking a good amount of live callers today with an extended segment for that. So thank you again kindly. But we talk about the Mets. Those guys stand me. Eduardo Escobar is red hot for the first time this season. He's a guy that you obviously have to watch, and you should be hoping that he has a strong series again. But Escobar, I expect him to do well against the Angels. Marcana, I expect him to do well against the Angels. Some guys that looked well so far out west. But Nemo and Lindor are those X factors for this team. We need them to try their best to step up, even if they're not 100% right now, if the Mets continue not have Marte or Alonso for one or multiple games in this three-game set. So now getting on to folks, let's talk about key halos this series. Now, the halos, again, why have they fallen 14 straight? And that led them to firing Joe Madden, of course. Well, everything went wrong for them. The offense has been completely top-loaded. They have dealt with some significant injuries to the likes of a all-star caliber player this year out of nowhere and Taylor Ward. Yes, we have a T. Ward and myself, and same thing with him. I, I love Taylor Ward. He's done a phenomenal job. But he was placed on the IL a couple days ago, unfortunately, for the Angels. And losing him has definitely hurt because he has been a huge piece to that success offensively outside of Mike Trout, Shohei, Anthony Rendon is out for an extended period of time too on the injured list. And then you have guys that are underperforming plenty this year. I mean, the fact that the Angels have had, yesterday they had Juan Lagares batting cleanup. They had Duffy high in the lap. They, tr quite literally, when you get from, you know, three or four down throughout the four through nine, that Angels lap has been abysmal. And it's not at all surprised that they have struggled to have consi uh, consistent offense. And even when they have had the offense, they haven't had the bullpen to back it up. That's been the bigger issue for them. The Angels this season have the 25th ranked bullpen in baseball. It's absolutely garbage. And you would have thought that after bringing back Rysel Glacius, after signing you know, Ryan Tapera, after signing Aaron Loop, and even Archie Bradley, even though that Archie Bradley hasn't looked that great in recent years, you thought, wow, they're finally bolstering your bullpen. That could be one of the best in baseball. But no, the Angels' bullpen has been absolutely atrocious this year. And one of the main guys that stood out in negative fashion has, in fact, been Aaron Loop. Loop so far this year, for anyone wondering why the Mets didn't bring him back and take him on the high contract, and now I'm leaving a year in 2021. I love this time with the Mets, but I knew he wouldn't come back and do the same exact thing. And even in a different setting, I'm aware, no less, Loop this season has a 4.43 year array. Not that that means much for a reliever, but he has a 17 plus year array in his past handful of games, including seven earned runs and 3.2 innings over a seven game span. He has only been able to pitch one solid inning, one full inning for the uh, for the Angels in the past seven games that he's been out there to pitch at minimum one inning. He has not even been able to get more than one out or two more often than not over this horrendous stretch for Aaron Loop. And again, I don't wish that on him whatsoever. I love Aaron Loop, but he has definitely been a problem. Archie Bradley's been a problem. Ryan Tapera has been solid. Rysel Iglesias has been up and down their closer, and they just haven't had that consistency. The only thing that the Angels have been consistent with so far this year, folks, is surprising enough, their rotation. The Angels' rotation is right around the middle of the pack so far this season. They have been solid, rock solid, and they've kept them in games more often than not. But a lack of complete depth offensively that I'm not surprised with Artie Marino being the schmuck that he is, the owner for the Angels, and the bullpen just not even getting close to getting close to expectations. That has led to this 14-game losing streak. And again, we'll see how much of that approach stays or changes as they enter this series against the Mets. But Mike Trout, I mean, need I say more? Trout is day-to-day -day right now still with a uh, groin tightness, I believe. But he's probably going to be playing in at least two to three games against the Mets, if I had to say. It looks like he may have been available off the bench today's game. I don't even know if he's in the lineup. I'd have to double-check. But I would expect Trout to be in the majority of the series as long as he's really not laboring too much. And Mike Trout is on, surprise, surprise, at MVP, Cal MVP caliber pace after starring, you know, over the past handful of games, had the worst stretch of his career going like 0 for 22. And I know that may not seem like much, but that was the longest stretch of a hitless streak for Mr. Mike Trout in his career. And as you can tell, as he's getting a little bit older now, he's dealing with some more injuries, more common. And it's unfortunate because Mike Trout is, again, the face of baseball in so many ways and doesn't get nearly enough credit that he deserves as, again, the best player in baseball for a decade straight now. But Trout, looking at his numbers, I mean, need I say more? You just break down here for a second. 52 games played for Trout this year. He has 14 home runs, 30 RBIs, a 284 average, and a 989 OPS, just shy of 1,000 OPS. I mean, Trout is doing Trout things, and we all know we have to keep an eye on him. It's not the matter of if you can hold him to not doing anything in the series, but rather limit him 
to not completely ball out. That's really the biggest thing when you look at Mike Trout because he is just such an anomaly of a player, truly is special and such an entertaining talent. Cannot say enough great things about the man. But then outside of Trout, we have the other generational player and Shohei Otani. Shohei, who again, gets the start tonight at the time recording this as a sub-40 around the year. However, batting-wise, Otani's had the pop of the slugging, but he has struggled with the average. You know, he has been striking out a bit, has had his ups and downs so far offensively, but no less is still second on the Angels in home runs. And again, it's Shohei Otani. His swing is beautiful. He is, in my opinion, one of, if not the best player in the league. I mean, from an overall standpoint, I think Shohei is without a doubt the best player in the league because there, there's no one like him. He's just truly something special. He's not off to that ridiculous hot start that he was last year where he ended up with over 40 bombs. But again, we'll see how he looks in the second half and in this series. But Otani on the year as well, who's been struggling as of late, has only batted 200 and 613 OPS for his past seven games entering tonight's. Uh, Otani in 57 games this year as a batter. 11 home runs, 32 RBIs, a 242 average, and a 765 OPS. So not terrible in numbers, but definitely underperforming a little bit for what we've seen over the past year with Shohei and just being the face of baseball, to put it lightly. But outside those guys, I also have, again, for the same reason that I said a couple minutes ago, and Patrick Sandoval. I mean, Patrick Sandoval is an absolute stud. He is a young stud in the making southpaw for the Angels. And he, in my opinion, again, can be potentially the biggest X factor in the Mets winning or losing this series. If Sandoval carves the Mets up the same way the Mets got carved up by Sean Mania last night, regardless of if they have Alonzo and Martin in the lineup, because both those guys have struggled with lefties against this, uh, this year too. It hasn't just been recently because of what we saw with Mania and with Urias and also Tyler Anderson for the Dodgers. But yeah, I mean, Sandoval, he is my other guy I'm watching. Yes, they have some solid hitters too. I mean, in Walsh, but they haven't been consistent enough this year. The Angels, they've been at, on this horrendous losing streak. And all I know is that this is going to be a really fun matchup. I'm looking forward to it. And hopefully the Mets, again, can try to take full advantage of an Angels team that is quite literally at the biggest low by far they've been on, not just this year, but in some years past, which is saying a lot because the Angels have had a complete lack of success throughout the large tenure, the entire tenure for the most part of Mike Trout's uh, time and now Shohei Otani's with the LA Angels. But guys, I think that's all you really need to know from a series preview aspect. I know we're right around a half hour into this one. So I'm going to pivot here in a second to getting on to now what is going right and what's going wrong for the Mets. And then once I break down that segment for you, I'll be cutting things off for people on replay because I know you probably don't want to watch more than 40 to 45 minutes of a series preview show, even though we have all these updates. And again, I appreciate everyone that's been chiming in in the last. But one more statistic that I would like to give a couple guys is that overall through fan graphs, the Mets, even with Really not doing anything offensively the past couple of games, getting blown out. They're still the number one ranked offense, especially with war per fan graphs for F war. Then you have the LA Angels. They currently ranked as a 14th ranked offense in baseball. Starting pitching, the Mets currently, even with their injuries, are the ninth ranked rotation of baseball. And the Angels are 11th. Again, the Angels have had really strong starting pitching this year. That has been the one thing that's gone right for them when everything else has gone wrong. It's just hilarious because it's like they can't have them both in unison as of now because, again, for years, the biggest issue for them has been starting pitching and bullpen. Now they actually have starting pitching, but they're lacking the bullpen and they're lacking consistency with the offense depth-wise. But then in the relief pitchers as well, the Mets, their bullpen is ranked 16th on the season. I'm going to shed some light on the bullpen because I know a lot of people love to jump on it quick. And I understand they did not look good in the Padres series. But regardless, the Angels, again, 25th ranked bullpen in baseball. That's where you need to try to try to grind out early at bats against those stars, especially a guy like Sandoval. If you can get him out after, say, only five innings, that'd be absolutely massive. So you can get to that rather shaky and completely up and down bullpen for the Halos. But with that being said, folks, now let's shift into our next segment. Continue smashing that like and subscribe on again if you've been enjoying the show. I was getting 100 likes for the first short-term goal in here in the show if we haven't already. Thank you so much in advance. And again, help us get a 16K subs. I see, uh, let's see, Renee, 1,200. Haim, how's it going? Patrick, uh, going down the list further. Jose, Nick, Nathan, John, uh, Sledge, all you guys, thank you kindly for chiming in, everyone that's been chiming in the live stream. Like I said, we will be taking live callers here in a little bit. But now let's go from one slide to the other, folks. So we talked about everything on the series preview front. So now let's talk about how good and how bad is it right now for the New York Mets. Naturally, when you see the Mets lose to the Padres, again, a very good team this year, one of the best in baseball and in the NL, we all know the context behind that. But I want to emphasize that further because the Mets, as of now, they're three and four in this West Coast trip. We'll see if they can get above 500 or actually 
and the West Coast are below 500 based on how this Angels matchup goes. But they've only scored a total of three runs, three effing runs, and their four losses. So when the Mets have been losing, they've been losing completely. And not just with some poor pitching, but they haven't had any offense whatsoever. So as much as we want to harp on Bassett and his lack of performance as of late, and the relievers not looking great in certain outings, we got to realize, too, that even with both Alonzo Marte being out again, it's justified. Um, you still want more production from what we've been seeing. And again, we haven't seen it over the past couple of games, at least. However, the Mets, again, have been outscored 41 to 33 in eight games here in June. And injuries have played a heavy factor. And I cannot emphasize that enough, folks. And that's why this is a positive that I think people really need to make sure that they wrap their head around. The Mets are 17 games above 500, a seven-game lead on the Braves. Are the Braves and the Phillies rolling right now, having good win streaks? Absolutely. Do I think it'll stop anytime soon? No, I don't. I mean, the Braves have a series now with the Pirates, and the uh, Phillies, last time I checked earlier today, were winning 3-1 against the Brewers. I'll see what the final score is later on, potentially in today's show. But the Mets, again, they are unfortunately slumping a little bit at a bad time. But again, that cushion was massive for them entering June to begin with. And if they have a 500 road trip, then in my opinion, that's a massive success knowing who you're facing and knowing the injuries you've had. This isn't just injuries with Alonzo Marte, guys. This is injuries with Nimmo and Lindor that are lingering. Both these guys, again, are not 100%. Yes, they're in the lap, so yes, they still need to perform. I 100% understand that. I agree. So I'm not going to give them every excuse in the world. But the point I'm trying to make is that this is a Mets team that basically all their top dogs right now are dealing with ailments to, you know, lesser or higher degrees. And because of that reason, naturally, you're going to have yourselves getting into some slumps. And when you face really good pitching, like the Mets have seen plenty here out West, yeah, it's not all that surprising that the Mets are struggling. That is going to happen. But to expand further, folks, on the pitching side, for the Mets at least, surrendering runs has definitely not been fun so far out West. They've given up 18 earned runs in eight games here in June for their starters. For relief pitchers, they've given up 15 earned runs in eight games. Now, looking at the context of this, Chris Bassett over his past five games, past five starts, has surrendered 22 earned runs in 26 innings pitch. This is far and away the worst stretch that Bassett has had in his entire career. He wasn't just rattled. He was really upset last night. He took full accountability, which I always love and appreciate about Bassett. He's not going to BS. He's not going to do nothing. He's going to tell you straight how it is. He's a straight shooter. He knows that he's not playing well right now, and he just hopes he can get out of this rut because he's never dealt like this before. So kind of similar to Walker Bueller having the worst start to a season for himself, respectively, for the Dodgers. It's hard to combat that right away when you're not used to this. And that's been the case not just for Bassett, but for Bueller and some other guys that have been studs of a starter for basically their entire careers in the MLB. And Bassett, again, is finally going through that first rough stretch of his career. And it, it, it certainly won't be his last, hopefully just not to this extent. But he has an average 7.6 year ray after out of his last five games started. Then when you look at who he's faced, let's give context too. He's faced the Cardinals, the Giants, the Phillies, Dodgers, Padres. All really strong teams. Phillies are the less, lesser one out of those as of now, obviously. But the point again is these are, again, the best teams in baseball in many ways. So if you're going to give up runs, I'm not a, I'm not opposed to you giving up runs. Like, I understand why it's going to happen against great teams. That's inevitable. It's not going to just happen with Bassett, but it's going to happen with, other, with others. But outside of that, we all feel, and I, I feel strongly this way, that Bassett's lack of success as of late has went directly in hand with Max Scherzer's absence. You know, Scherzer and him had really gelled well in that dugout when they ha when Scherzer hasn't been there. That definitely has had an impact in him, on him, in my opinion. But more than anything, just not having that enough of a cushion in the rotation for Bassett, who's not an ace, we know that. He could be ace on some lesser teams, of course, and is, you know, at his peak like earlier in the year. But he's a number three or a number four. You know, that is what Bassett is expected to be for the Mets this season. So when you view him as a number one and you have him in a rut right now, again, these things happen in baseball. Shouldn't be all that surprising. But again, I'm not concerned with Chris Bassett. I just think that he needs to, one, on his arsenal and love his arsenal, but I think he just needs to narrow it down a bit. He's been struggling to find command with the likes of Patrick Mazika and even Nito at times. And this is a guy that, again, is just in his own head. But thankfully for the Mets, at least, Bassett who's struggling, I feel like we've seen the worst of Chris Bassett this season. I feel like we are going to continue to see better of him down the stretch this year. So not overly concerned, just you can tell that the pressure has gone to him a bit against some great teams here in the NL. And also, uh, yeah, just the NL, not the AL. Uh, but then the rest of the rotation for the Mets, and this includes Trevor Williams. It does not include Tom, uh, Thomas Zipucky's start because that was literally just any 
an inning, and he was horrendous. But for Tywin Walker, Trevor Williams, David Pearson, and Cookie Carrasco combined over their past five starts, they have totaled a 3.6 ERA. So the Mets rotation has been really solid. As state of flowing, Trevor Williams has been actually one of, if not the biggest, bright spot. Williams has been absolute money for the Mets for quite a bit now. He's been going 4-5 strong every fifth day. Or if you need him as a lawn reliever, he can handle that and eat those innings by far, so proud of him. Same thing with Taiwan Walker. has been looking strong. Yes, he gave up four earned and not a great start as last one, but ty has been keeping the Mets in it for sure. He's been going around five to seven innings his past five plus starts. And then the same thing here with Cookie Carrasco. Cookie has been a little up and down, but man, oh man, has Cookie been looking fantastic when he is right this season. And just overall, this rotation has definitely um, exceeded expectations, I would say given the injuries to both DeGrom and Bassett to this point. So it's good knowing that the biggest problem for the Mets in their rotation at this juncture is the guy on paper that should be their best starter in Chris Bassett. That means that this is clearly a mental thing. He's losing his location. He'll get back, and everyone else is stepping up. That's huge. And now we get Tyler McGill back, and who knows, over the next next month, there's a strong possibility that we will have not just one, but potentially both a Max Scherzer and Jacob DeGrom back in this rotation. And man, oh man, am I pumped just thinking about that. But for the rotation, that's context in case you're wondering. Not as bad as I think people are making it out to be. It just stands out more, of course, when the Mets don't score runs either. When it's a blowout win where, uh, for the Padres, example, where the Mets don't have off offense or pitching it's not going to look great absolutely but now we get into the relievers some guys that have been struggling here in june and some guys have been thriving far better than i think he, they've been getting credit for but getting into the guys that have been struggling and unfortunately it's my guy and i i like joely rodriguez quite a bit but he has not had a good start in june and four games he's only been able to get 2.2 innings he has not been able to get enough outs he's given up four earned runs so joely who again has a solid start to the season, has been a little up and down as of late. I want to see better from him. Him and Chase and Shreve have just not been consistent for a long period of time as those lefty relievers in the pen. And that just further gives you an idea that, yeah, there's a solid chance that the Mets won't just acquire pen help at the deadline, but potentially a lefty, they can find someone feasible and nice fit, whether he's a rental or a controllable reliever too. But Rodriguez has been struggling, so that's been part of the context. Then you have Colin Holderman and Nagosik, two guys that weren't even supposed to be in the Mets pen to start this year. They've exceeded expectations in so many ways, but they've finally gotten got, if you will. And they, they haven't just been thrown into the fire at times, but they just, again, got worked with the Padres this series. They gave, gave up seven earned runs total between these two and this three-game set against the Padres. So that has definitely been the lowest point for the Mets in their bullpen as of late. Two guys that, again, are not ideally, who knows how much of impact they're going to have on the, on the Mets down the stretch. Holderman, I think he has potentially higher chances than Nagosik. Buck loves Holderman. He's favoring him a lot. Nagosik's been solid, but Nagosik also got worked pretty bad yesterday, giving up four earned. So that's not fun. But the one big bright spot in this bullpen right now, guys, in case you're unaware, is in fact Adam Adovino. And a lot of people have criticized Adovino a lot, but little do you guys probably know that Adovino in his last 14 games, 14 appearances and 12 innings, has only given up one measly run. One measly run. He's given up little to no hits. He's only given up a couple walks. Adovino has been absolutely cruising the past couple weeks for the Mets, and no one and their mother is talking about it. So I want to give credit where credit's due. Adovino has been a massive bright spot in this pen as of late. has been getting crucial outs without Frisbee slider and then mixing that up with the fastball. The biggest thing with Adovino is when he has blown, you know, had bad outings so far this year, which have been few and far in between, they've just been significant. He's come in situations where it was basically low as jam, like Ty Lord's start a couple starts ago before his injury and others and higher leverage situations. Adam, Adam Adovino has notoriously been up and down in his career, but how Buck has been utilizing him as of late, he's been fantastic. And I love that. Very happy with what I've seen from Adovino as of late, and hopefully he continues that. That's definitely positive for this Mets pen, along with some others. Seth Lugo, of course, gave up three earned to blow what would have hopefully been a save against the Dodgers there, even though that they got with Adonis Medina in game four that series. Lugo, however, even though outside that outing, he's been pretty solid as of late outside that one. Just, again, Lugo's a little bit inconsistent, and it's easy to just focus on that one outing because him, like Adovino, when they blow it, they blow it kind of significantly. They're not just giving up one earned run. They're giving up a minimum of two or three. So it's like kind of like Edwin Diaz from years past in the sense where you know when Edwin doesn't have it, like he really doesn't have it. And that's what we've seen in parts few and far in between once more with Ottavino and the likes of Lugo. But the point I'm trying to make, folks, is this is a Mets team that should we have rightful criticism? Absolutely. Should we be concerned? Should we be on, you know, should we be leaning on the edge of our seats 
stressing out about the Braves and the Phillies right now. Should we truly panic about the Mets right now after losing a series against the Padres without Marte, without Alonzo, and without a fully healthy Francisco Lindor and Brandon Nimmo? What are we the four best pieces and most crucial pieces to this lineup offense and defensively? No. The last thing you should do is be panicking right now. I'm the farthest thing from concern. But again, criticisms, rightfully so. We are seeing what's working, what's not. How Bassett has faltered. Hopefully he bounce back and his next start and gets on an upward direction here. But I, all I got to say is while that Padres series wasn't fun, there were just so many factors and justifiable excuses that went in hand with why the Mets simply weren't going to win that series. Or would I like to see them have a more valiant effort? 1,000% the offense I still want to see more from. But even with that being said, I, I, I feel very strongly that things would have been different if Alonzo and Marte never got hurt the way that they did in game one of that series um, or game two, I should say. But guys, from there, that is going to do it here for breaking down everything that you guys need to know about not just the series preview against the Angels, but also deep diving and breaking down really how good or how bad has it been for the Mets. It's, it hasn't been nearly as bad as people are making out to be. But again, when you give up 20 plus earned runs over the past two games, 48 hour span, and only muster one measly run in those one or two, I should say. Yeah, naturally, it's going to look ridiculously lopsided because it was, and it's going to make fans overthink and overreact. I don't believe this is a June swoon situation, knocking on wood by any stretch. The Mets are getting healthier. They're getting McGill back. They'll get Scherzer and DeGrom back in July. And again, health-wise, the guys are getting better getting back from their injuries. So that is absolutely massive. But folks, for people in the live stream, now we're going to start. We're going to be taking your live calls very soon. I'm going to answer some comments here in the live show. Then we'll get to the caller segment that we'll be doing for a prolonged time today. Like I said, we'll be live for two plus hours long today. I want to see what you guys have to say. If you're going to call into the show, we'll go from there. But for people on replay, this is where I'll be cutting things off. I know this was a longer series preview. My apologies once more, but make sure to let me know your thoughts down below. How do you feel about the Mets and what they've done so far in June? Do you like it? Do you dislike it? Are you hoping that the Mets at least go around 500 to wrap up the West Coast trip that I was hoping? And said so if the Mets can do that, then they are by all means in a good spot, regardless on the success or lack thereof that teams like the Braves and Phillies have been having as of late. No less, make sure to let me know all your thoughts. Continue smashing that like and subscribe button if you enjoyed this segment, regardless of when you watch it. And again, I'll be back real soon, folks, with consistent Mets coverage for the Angels series per usual. Live stream, folks, let's get your comments. People on replay, this is where we're wrapping things up.